In January 1987, Francis P. Wall, a private first class in the U.S. Army during the Korean War, spoke to John Timmerman, an associate of the J. Allen Hynek Center for UFO Studies, KUFOS, in Chicago, Illinois, about a very strange event involving a UFO that he and other men experienced in 1951 while serving in the Korean War. UFO enthusiast Richard F. Haynes, a former San Jose State University associate professor and part-time scientist, looked into Wall's background in an attempt to confirm his story and discovered that, indeed, Mr. Wall was a Korean combatant in the Army Infantry 25th Division, 27th Regiment, 2nd Battalion, Easy Company at the time of the event. Wall claims that it was spring 1951. He and his unit were stationed on a mountainside in an area that, on the military maps, was known as the Iron Triangle near Shorwan. A Korean village lay below this mountain. Wall remembered that earlier in the morning they had sent some men in to warn the villagers that they were going to bombard the village with artillery. Now, as night fell, the men proceeded to light the place up. There were aerial artillery bursts coming in. Suddenly something very strange happened something that none of the men present could quite understand. But we suddenly noticed on our right hand side what appeared to be a jack-o'-lantern come wafting down across the mountain. And at first no one thought anything about it. So we noticed that this thing continued on down to the village to where, indeed, the artillery air bursts were exploding. It had an orange glow in the beginning. We further noticed that this object was so quick that it could get into the center of an air burst of artillery and yet remain unharmed." Unquote. Wall claims that they observed the object hovering in the area for roughly 45 minutes to an hour. At some point, it began to approach the men, changing from an orange glow to a brilliant blue-green light. Quote, there's no way to compare it. The light was pulsating. The object approached us. I asked for and received permission from Lieutenant Evans, our company commander at that time, to fire upon this object, which I did with an M1 rifle with armor-piercing bullets, and I did hit it. It must have been metallic because you could hear when the projectile slammed into it." Unquote. Wall and the other men were confounded by this. They wondered why a simple bullet would damage the craft where a heavy onslaught of artillery rounds didn't. Quote, I don't know, unless they had dropped their protective field around them or whatever, but the object went wild and the light was going on and off. It went off completely once briefly and it was moving erratically from side to side as though it might crash to the ground. Then a sound. We had heard no sound previous to this. The sound of, like, diesel locomotives revving up. That's the way this thing sounded, unquote. Things went from strange to downright terrifying as the object advanced on the stunned men and by all accounts began to microwave them where they stood. Quote, we were attacked. We were swept by some form of a ray that was emitted in pulses, in waves that you could visually see only when it was aiming directly at you. That is to say, like a searchlight sweeps around and you would see it coming at you. Now you would feel a burning, tingling sensation all over your body, as though something were penetrating you. The company commander, Lieutenant Evans, hauled us into our bunkers. We didn't know what was going to happen. We were scared, unquote. Wall claims that they went into an underground bunker, one with peepholes, which allowed the men to fire on the enemy. He and another soldier peered out. The object was hovering over the area, lighting up the whole area. He described that it stayed there for a while before quickly shooting off at a 45 degree angle and disappearing into the darkness. Just there and gone, he told Timmerman. After the object departed, the men assumed that it, that was the end of it. However, within three days of the event, the entire company fell ill. Wall recalled how some men were evacuated by ambulance. They had to cut roads in there and haul them out. They were too weak to walk. They had dysentery, he told Timmerman. Even stranger was that upon being examined, it was determined that the men had an extremely high white blood cell count, which the doctors could not account for. Quote, now in the military, especially the army, each day you file a company report. We had a confab about that. Do we file it in the report or not? The consensus was no, because they'd lock every one of us up and think we're crazy. At that time, no such thing as a UFO had ever been heard of and we didn't know what it was. I still don't know what it was, unquote. Wall continued to suffer with physical ailments when he returned stateside, including an inability to maintain weight, periods of disorientation, and memory loss. It seems clear that Wall believed his physical ailments were connected to what happened that night in the spring of 1951, the night he and his fellow soldiers were attacked by a UFO.
On February 28, 2003, a security guard working the graveyard shift at a landfill in Phoenix, Arizona, claims to have had a baffling encounter. He recalled that he just started his shift. It was around 9 p.m. He was sitting in his truck on a hill. For some reason, he began to get sleepy. He believes that he must have fallen asleep because when he woke up, he was in a different place. Quote, Next thing I remember is waking up with aliens guiding me down a long hallway with windows in it. I could look out and see a close-up view of the moon. I was no longer on Earth, unquote. It is unclear if the man was actually seeing the moon, but that's what he believes he was seeing. The man described the beings he saw as taller than him, standing around 6'1". They appeared human-like, except for their heads, which were bald and larger than a normal human head. They also wore a uniform. Their skin was white, almost transparent. Quote, they showed me to a hammock-like bed to lie down, and next to it was a hammock with another person in it. I couldn't see who it was. There was a large podium. The room was filled with a pinkish-orange light, unquote. After laying down, the being spoke to the man telepathically, informing him that he had nothing to fear from them, and that he was to pass that message along. At that point, they informed him that someone was waiting for him, and that it was time to go. Quote, I found myself in my truck, and two hours had passed. Quote. So what happened to this man? Was it all a dream? Or had he actually been taken to the moon? It's interesting to note that numerous other abductees also claimed to have been taken to the moon by their captors. What of the message to him that he had nothing to fear and that he was to pass that along? Why would it matter unless their intention was to, at some point, reveal themselves? Even more curious, what did they mean when they told him that someone was waiting for him? Were they referring to somebody back on Earth, maybe somebody at his worksite? Possibly they were speaking of a future event in which he would play a role in. Ultimately, this case, if legitimate, needs to be followed up on. Witness claims to have spoken to a MUFON investigator, L. Fletchner, on June 7, 2016. So it'll be interesting to see if anything comes of it. Summing it up, the man believes that the whole event was a way for the beings to show off their advanced capabilities. Quote, I think they just wanted to show me the moon. Unquote. In California, a Native American man and his two family members claimed to have encountered something very strange one night while attending to a flat tire. The witness, a man named Jake, claims he was out driving one night when the lights in his car started to dim and then went completely out. He decided to pull off the side of the road to check to see if there was a loose wire. As he did so, he heard a loud noise. He had blown a tire. Upon checking his trunk, he discovered the spare he carried was low. He decided to try and call for help. Even though the reception wasn't great, he managed to get through to his Uncle Jay, who agreed to come out and help. He told Jake that it would be about an hour before he got there. As he waited, Jake found an old tire pump in his trunk. Even though it leaked, it was all he had. He began pumping up his spare tire. That's when he heard what sounded to him like flapping noises above him. At that point, it began to rain, so he decided to just pack it in and wait for his uncle to arrive. He got inside the vehicle and locked the door. Even though Jake didn't know it, his evening of bad luck was about to veer off into the bazaar. Quote, it was pitch dark out and I couldn't see nothing. No cars came and I started to feel spooked. I thought I saw something swoop by, but I thought my eyes were tripping. I fell asleep. That huge flapping sound kept waking me up. Unquote. Jake noted that aside from a hammer, he had no weapon to protect himself if something were to happen out there. Thankfully, his uncle Jay, along with his cousin Red, soon arrived on the scene. They got to work fixing the tire and checking the lights. When they were almost finished, the sound returned. To Jake, it sounded like a gigantic bird. Quote, we were almost done when the sound went right over top of us. Red pointed up and was stumbling on his words. We all looked up and saw this. I guess it looked like a man made of rock. It didn't look like a statue. Its skin was rough like rocks on the side of a cliff. It swooped, had wings, but not like a bat or a bird. Unquote creature, whatever it was, began heading for the nearby bluffs. The three men stood watching it in disbelief as it reached the bluffs. It seemed to blend into the rocks. They quickly finished up and got out of there. This is probably the first case I have read about in which a witness describes seeing a flying rock-like entity 
not unlike the Thing from the Fantastic Four comics, but with wings. Could it have been a misidentification, possibly a mass hallucination, or was it something else? It's curious to note that the man claims he began to have car trouble shortly before the entity appeared. Many people who encounter UFOs in their occupants also claim to have similar car troubles. With regards to what the three men encountered that night, it's up in the air, pun intended. As I said, I am unaware of any other cases involving rock-like entities with wings. As described by the man, he began to hear flapping sounds not long after getting out of his car. It sounds like the creature was circling his car, no doubt waiting for the opportunity to pounce. One has to wonder what might have happened to Jake had he remained out there for the remainder of the night. Quote, I don't know what it was. I don't want to know. We weren't drinking. It was tall, had thick legs, two wings, and it looked like it was made of rock. Unquote. 